Hi, and welcome to the third video for General Chemistry 1. In the last video, we talked about the earliest studies of atomic structure. Discoveries about atomic structure came really quickly in the 20th century, and today I want to tell you about one of the first applications of those discoveries. We still use it today to diagnose health problems like coronary artery disease and Alzheimer's. And the scientist who first used it went on to keep Nazi Germany from stealing Nobel Prizes from his friends and colleagues. But to get to that story, we have to start about three decades earlier. In the last video, we saw that Ernest Rutherford and his colleagues discovered that every atom contains a nucleus deep in its center, and that's where the positive charges are located. The reason the nucleus has a charge is because it contains tiny, positively charged particles called protons. Protons themselves are pretty interesting. They're made of quarks, which we can study using huge particle accelerators like the Large Hadron Collider that I talked about last time. But for now, let's just focus on the protons. Every atom has a nucleus with protons in it, and the number of protons has a huge impact on how atoms behave. Some atoms contain only one or a few protons, and others have well over a hundred. It can be hard to keep up with all the different possibilities, so luckily there's a chart that helps us keep everything straight and make it easy to understand. You've probably seen this chart before. It's called the Periodic Table of Elements, and there's a lot of useful information in it. We'll use it many times in future videos. You'll notice that each box in the chart has information about a different element. For example, here's iron, and oxygen is over here. As of 2019, we know of 118 different elements, and each one has its own box on the periodic table. These elements are all in order according to how many protons the nucleus contains. So for instance, hydrogen is the very first element in the table because hydrogen atoms have just one proton. You'll notice the number one in the box. This is called the atomic number, and it just tells us how many protons are in the atoms of that element. If we look over in this box, we see that this box is for gold, and it has an atomic number of 79. So every gold atom in the entire universe contains 79 protons, and every hydrogen atom contains just one proton. There are no exceptions. If we had a gold atom, and we took away one of its protons, it wouldn't be gold anymore. It would now have just 78 protons, which means it would now be a platinum atom. Gold and platinum are both metals, but are very different from each other, so taking away or adding just one proton clearly makes a big difference. I just mentioned that gold and platinum are both metals, which you probably already knew. And earlier I mentioned hydrogen and oxygen, which are not metals. In fact, it turns out that all metals are in the same part of the periodic table, over here on the left. And all non-metals are on the other end of the periodic table, over here. Hydrogen is the odd one out, and is over here on the left side even though it's a nonmetal. You might be wondering what the difference is between metals and nonmetals. We'll come up with a better definition in a video coming up soon, but for now we'll just say that pure metals tend to be shiny and usually conduct heat and electricity very well. This is true even for rare elements you may never have heard of, like tantalum or terbium. On the other hand, nonmetals usually aren't shiny and don't conduct electricity well you'll notice that there are a bunch of elements in between the two groups. These are borderline cases. They have properties that are a little like metals and a little like nonmetals. For example, tellurium. It's shiny like a metal, but it's a very poor conductor of heat and electricity. Since these elements have properties in between those of metals and nonmetals, they're called metalloids. Notice that there's an easy to remember border between the nonmetals and the metalloids. It's shaped like a staircase starting between boron and carbon. So, the nucleus is full of positively charged protons. In the last video, we mentioned that atoms also contain electrons, which have a negative charge, and we saw that people thought the electrons were scattered throughout the whole atom, like raisins in a plum pudding. But there's a problem with that model. You've probably heard the expression that opposites attract. That's very true when it comes to electrical charges. Negative and positive particles attract each other. You can see a very dramatic example of this whenever you see lightning. Electrons at the bottom of a cloud and positive charges on the ground attract each other, and when the two meet, the effect is dramatic. So the electrons in our atom should be attracted to the positive nucleus. They should just fall into the nucleus and get stuck there. This definitely isn't what happens. 
but why not? This was a tricky puzzle to figure out, but in 1913, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr found an answer. His solution used the science of quantum mechanics, and the math is a little more complicated than we're ready for yet, but we'll talk about it a lot in the course Physical Chemistry, which I hope you'll take later on. In a nutshell, what Bohr realized is that electrons can only be at certain distances from the nucleus. So, for example, they can be at this distance, or this distance, or this distance, but not in between. When you picture this in your mind, remember that atoms are three-dimensional, so the electrons don't travel in a circle like the moon going around the Earth. Instead, they move around on the surfaces of spheres centered on the nucleus. This view of an atom is called the Bohr model, and it's the mental picture that most people have when they think of an atom. It's been used as the picture of an atom in logos and comics for almost a hundred years. In reality, we soon realize that the location of an electron in an atom is a lot more complicated than this, but we'll get to that much later in this course. Before we move on, I want to mention that Niels Bohr was an actual hero for reasons that had nothing to do with science. During World War II, Nazi Germany occupied Denmark, where Bohr lived. For several years, Bohr and his wife, Marguerite, helped Jewish scientists in Germany flee to other countries by finding them work and arranging safe passage out of the country. Dozens of refugees, who later went on to create the science of nuclear physics, were helped to leave Europe by the Bohrs, and without them, many of them might have been killed. Eventually, the Bohrs themselves had to flee the country to avoid being arrested, and they settled in Sweden. But even then, Bohr wasn't done fighting Nazis. He helped convince King Gustav V of Sweden to offer asylum to Jewish refugees, and Sweden eventually welcomed over 7,000 Jews fleeing the Nazis in Denmark. So, our picture of atomic nuclear has become much more detailed. We have protons in the nucleus and electrons in orbits around them. But there's still one more important ingredient in atoms that we haven't mentioned yet. It turns out that the masses of atoms don't quite make sense if they only contain protons and electrons. For example, helium has an atomic number of two, so it has two protons, twice as many as hydrogen. But helium weighs four times as much as hydrogen. Since electrons weigh very little, there must be something else in the atom that makes up the extra weight. It turns out that the nucleus has more in it than just protons. In 1932, James Chadwick discovered that nuclei can contain a second kind of particle called a neutron. The reason it took so long to discover neutrons is because unlike electrons and protons, neutrons don't have an electrical charge, and that makes them harder to detect. Neutrons can have a very strong effect on the properties of an atom. Take hydrogen, for example. I mentioned earlier that hydrogen has an atomic number of one, so every hydrogen atom has one proton. Also, since atoms are neutral overall, every hydrogen atom must have one electron too, so that the charges on the proton and electron cancel out. But not all hydrogens have the same number of neutrons. Most hydrogen atoms don't have any neutrons at all. The nucleus is just one proton and nothing else. But some hydrogen atoms can have a nucleus with one or even two neutrons. In fact, hydrogen atoms with up to six neutrons have been discovered, but the four heaviest ones are extremely unstable, so we'll just talk about the first three. Atoms that have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, are called isotopes. Since these three atoms all have one proton, they are all isotopes of hydrogen. But they have very different properties. The first one, with no neutrons, is the most common, and when people talk about hydrogen, this is usually the isotope they mean. About 99.98% of all hydrogen atoms are this isotope. Most of the rest of the hydrogen in the universe is this one, about 0.02%. Because it has a neutron in it, this hydrogen atom is heavier than the one with no neutrons. In fact, protons and neutrons have about the same mass, so this nucleus is about twice as heavy as the first one. If you were to make water using only this second type of hydrogen, it would be heavier than water made using ordinary hydrogen. That kind of water is called heavy water, and you can tell it's noticeably heavier than ordinary water. If you make an ice cube of heavy water, it sinks in a glass of ordinary water instead of floating. Heavy water is also used in nuclear reactors, because it can slow down some of the particles produced in the reactor core, Ordinary water can't do that. 
The third hydrogen isotope has two neutrons, so it's even heavier, and it's highly radioactive. Almost none of the hydrogen on Earth is of this isotope. So these three isotopes are very different from one another, and the same is true for all the elements. Silver, for example, has 76 different isotopes. Only two of them are common, and the other 74 are all radioactive. So when we mention an element, it's often important to know which isotope we're talking about. Fortunately, there's an easy way to show which isotope you mean. Let's go back to the three hydrogen isotopes we mentioned earlier. Each one has one proton and one electron, but either zero, one, or two neutrons. To distinguish between them, we'll use what's called an isotope symbol. First, we write the symbol for the element from the periodic table. For all of these atoms, that'll be H for hydrogen. On the lower left of the symbol, we'll write down the atomic number. Remember, the atomic number is the number of protons, so for all three of these atoms, that's 1. Finally, in the upper left, we'll put the total number of protons and neutrons. That gives us 1 for the first atom, 2 for the second, and 3 for the third one. Notice that this tells us the total number of particles in the nucleus. Now it turns out that electrons weigh much less than protons and neutrons, so this number tells us approximately how much an atom weighs. For that reason, this is called the mass number. So for example, this isotope weighs about 3 AMU. AMU stands for atomic mass units. When we say the name of an isotope, we usually do it by giving the name of the element and the mass number. So for example, this isotope would be called hydrogen 3. When we see an isotope symbol, we actually know quite a lot about the atom. Take this isotope symbol, for example. If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that the symbol K tells us that this element is potassium. So this isotope would be called potassium 39. That also tells us that the atom weighs about 39 AMU. You can also tell how much of each type of particle this atom has. The atomic number is down here, and it tells us the atom has 19 protons. We could also have gotten that by looking at the periodic table. Since this is a neutral atom, we also know that there must be 19 electrons to balance out the 19 protons. And finally, we can also tell how many neutrons there are. Remember, the mass number tells us the number of particles in the nucleus. We know that 19 of them are protons, so all the rest must be neutrons. So there are 20 neutrons. There's one last thing to know about isotopes. You might remember that I told you that these two isotopes of hydrogen are the most common ones. If you were to pick a random hydrogen atom, it would probably be one of these, which means it would weigh about 1 AMU. But there's a small chance you'd get an atom of hydrogen 2, which weighs about 2 AMU. So, on average, the mass of a hydrogen atom is slightly higher than 1. We can figure out the exact mass with a quick calculation. You might remember that I said hydrogen is 99.98% hydrogen 1 and 0.02% hydrogen 2. To get the average mass, we'll multiply the mass of hydrogen 1 by 99.98% and multiply the mass of hydrogen 2 by 0.02% and then add them together. Remember, to change a percentage to a decimal, we have to divide the percentage by 100. Now, I mentioned before that the mass number tells us the approximate mass. So hydrogen 1 weighs about 1 AMU, and hydrogen 2 weighs about 2. But in this calculation, I want to be more precise than that. It turns out that hydrogen 1 weighs 1.0078 AMU. Pretty close to 1, but not exact. Meanwhile, hydrogen 2 weighs 2.0141 AMU. When I do the calculation, I get an average mass for hydrogen of 1.0080 AMU. If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that the atomic masses are written at the bottom of each block. For hydrogen, that's 1.00784 AMU. That's pretty much what we got, but the number on the periodic table is more precise. All the atoms on the periodic table were calculated this way. They're all averages of the different isotopes for each element, with the more common isotopes weighted more heavily than the rare ones.
Now that we talked a bit about isotopes, I can finally tell you about one of their neat applications. In 1923, the Hungarian chemist Georges de Hevesy had the idea of using radioactive isotopes to study living things. He placed lead-212, which is radioactive, in soil, where it was absorbed by the roots of plants. Every so often, he would pick one of the plants and place it on a photographic plate, where the radioactive lead would leave a mark. That way, de Hevesy could tell where in the plant the lead went. He was able to monitor the lead as it traveled up the stem and eventually to other parts of the plant. The plants he used were broad beans, also called fava beans, and it was the first time anyone had used a radioactive tracer to monitor what was happening inside a living thing. Today, radioactive tracers are very common in diagnostic medicine. For example, you might be given an injection of thallium-201, which would travel to your heart and allow doctors to see it during a PET scan. That's one way of diagnosing coronary artery disease, and it saved hundreds or even thousands of lives. De Hevesy also has a connection with Niels Bohr, who we mentioned earlier. De Hevesy was Jewish, and he was one of the scientists that Bohr helped to escape Nazi-occupied Europe. Before that, de Hevesy helped two of his colleagues keep gold out of the hands of Nazi Germany. Max von Laue and James Frank had both won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Both were Jewish and would later flee Germany, but it was illegal to send gold out of the country. Since the Nobel Prizes had their names on them, they would have been arrested if they tried to send them to their friends overseas, but they also didn't want to leave their medals behind to be confiscated by the Germans. So de Hevesy used chemistry to help them out. Von Laue and Frank both gave him their Nobel Prizes, and he dissolved both metals in a combination of acids called aqua regia. The dissolved gold gives a clear red solution, which looks nothing like the original metal. De Hevesy put these solutions in bottles on a shelf in his lab, and when German police searched the lab, they paid no attention to the unlabeled bottles of red liquid, which probably looked very ordinary. Once the war was over, de Hevesy was able to get the gold back out of the solutions, and the Nobel Committee took the gold and recast the medals. So von Laue and Frank were able to get their prizes back, and they were even made of the original gold. Well, that's enough for now. Next time, we'll move on from individual atoms and start talking about how to combine them to form molecules and ions. Until then, have a good week.